uh, this whole uh, if, topic, I didn't know a thing about. And, and my friend back there, Mike Burns, I'm going to tell you, you'll be out of here by 1020. <laughs> but here's the thing. It, when you do research, you go down, I'm doing this, checking that, but eventually you go down what I call a rabbit hole. Oh, that's interesting. You go down all these different places and pick up so much more. And that's why it'll take until 1025 uh, to get out of here. Well, maybe not. You know, I love these machines, and then I don't. Um, the whole thing started, uh, not for me, but from someone else. Could you look into this? And so I began to look into it, and originally, well, the previously mentioned Jenna Edwards that said, will you speak at the December meeting about the streets of Fredericksburg? Okay. But then this appeared, and the topic is actually the eight, roughly the 80th anniversary of this ship, the Mary Ball. It, it, it actually, I knew something about things. It was what's called a liberty ship. So I want to go into that. It, it's our ship, but it was one of many. And frankly, though everything comes with great celebration, what happened to the Mary Ball would have been very, what I'll call pedestrian, was it not for her involvement in a rescue at sea. So we're going to talk about that. And that has to do, as I went down a rabbit hole, with another one of our local people. Mystery, mystery. Uh, then part of that rescue involved lifeboat number six. There's a book called Lifeboat Number Six. Thick. <laughs> I read it. Thank you, Amazon. I found it. But it turns out when you Google the phrase lifeboat number six, this is what comes up. Lifeboat number six on the Titanic. And this would be Margaret Brown of Denver, the unsinkable Molly Brown. That's just one of those rabbit holes. But I also want to acknowledge that what I'm telling you, and while I did investigate it, I wouldn't have started it. I wouldn't have researched it if it weren't for my longtime collaborator. Now, collaboration in World War II is not a good thing, particularly if you're French. Um, but my collaborator is someone you know. It's someone with whom I have worked on several other presentations here. And now she re resides not on lifeboat number six, but in Charlotte, North Carolina, <laughs> Becky Starr. So I want to acknowledge that she had this idea. She looked it up. The author here, uh, Kevin Gom, is Australian. She's even talked to him, talked to his publicist. The woman is relentless. Um, so I want to acknowledge Becky's idea behind this. Uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known about it. So after all of that, what happens at the end, we'll talk about that. But here's what we're here to talk about. The SS Mary Ball, it, it is one of several, couple thousand Liberty ships. And that, of course, is a World War II concoction. The North Atlantic Ocean, from the moment World War II opened, and then actually before that, until the end of World War II, 
was one continuous point of conflict. It is the longest battle in World War II. In other words, it lasted the whole time. Uh, the Brits needed shipping. They, by the time the Germans got rolling, starting in 1939 into the 40s, the Brits needed help. And this actually involved another local personality because Franklin Roosevelt as president developed, we were trying to stay out of that war, developed the Lend-Lease program. We're gonna lend you this stuff to help you and then we'll get it back at the end of the war. And he used the analogy, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you're gonna lend him your garden hose, but you'll get it back when the fire's out. Well, that's what he was trying to do with old ships to send to Britain. Now, we're not just talking warships. Great Britain is an island, duh, Scott, they know that. <laughs> but the fact is, it was cut off from the rest of Europe. Everything that Britain used to survive and fight got to them across water. Think of that, everything and they needed a million tons of stuff a day. Everything. So it, it was sort of daunting. They developed the concept of convoys crossing the North Atlantic, groups of ship, um, uh, merchant ships protected by warships, but my goodness, the German Navy's U-boats, undersea boats, submarines, were taking a, a drastic toll the blue dots on this map represent the merchant ships that went down in the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so when you're trying to get tonnage to Great Britain, unfortunately, you've got to overplay your hand and hope that some of it gets through. All right, and this is the whole early part of the war. It took until early 1944 for the Allied group to reach parity. In other words, uh, the Germans kept sinking these boats. Now, somebody was looking ahead, and I don't think it was Winston Churchill, because he was here in 1929. He was out of a job and writing stories about American topics like the American Civil War. He had lunch downtown at the Princess Anne Inn. Great quote. I'll get to that another talk. But somebody in Britain must have seen what was coming because they began to stockpile merchant ships. And most of these were World War I type ships. They were floating, and I hate to say this, they were expendable. If they sunk that, it's only a 30 year old ship. The American efforts simply were to help Britain lend them ships to get stuff to them. All right, so that's the key concept of all of this stuff. And then they developed what's called the Liberty Ship, just a basic ship. In fact, it was so basic, everybody said it was ugly. And they were nicknamed Ugly Ducklings in the idea stage. Gee, I, the, the SS Mary Ball, an ugly duckling. No, that isn't what it was called. So the, the Atlantic, as we know it, you know, that whole side of the globe, but these ships were going down daily, being torpedoed. Um, as warfare got more intense, of course, it was torpedoing without warning a merchant ship, an unarmed merchant ship. The rules of war, I'm always amazed that war has rules, but said originally you couldn't torpedo an unarmed merchant ship. You had to let the crew know you were gonna torpedo them and they could leave the ship. That wasn't the case. There were basic ships in World War I that were called hogs. Gee, the SS Mary Ball, a hog. See, nothing works, <laughs> nothing works. By the mid thirties, both the US and Britain were adding to their merchant fleets. They, they knew something had to be done. 
1936, and watch how this ramps up. 50, make us 50 ships. They doubled the order in 39 and doubled that order in 1940. That's based on need and destruction of the others. Gee, I early am past 1020. <laughs> And in 1940, they ordered 60 so-called ocean-class freighters, you know, bigger than basic. So what were we going to do? Well, Liberty Ship was the idea that came up, and it is, as you see here, a pretty basic ship. It's cargo hold. Uh, a deck that could also hold cargo. It does have, if you look, a gun at the front gun in the stern, an aircraft gun, and the aircraft gun. So it's armed. Right away you know if this is in combat, it's a sitting duck. Uh, there were 18 shipyards in this country producing. Now, you've got to understand that in Boston, Brooklyn, Norfolk, Charleston, on this coast, Los Angeles, San Diego, there were military, naval shipyards producing warships. These Liberty ships were produced, and imagine the map, and I didn't do it, starting up the East Coast, Portland, Maine was producing these. Boston also had a shipyard for these. Brooklyn had a shipyard for both. Coming on down, Baltimore, Newport News, Wilmington, North Carolina, in other words, not large military ships, but merchant ships. So all that's going on. And you then get around to how are we going to build it. The first one took 244 days. Well, let's see. 18 times that, that's 218 the first year. See, that wasn't good enough. So they had to streamline the pass, the, the thing. They also took this design and altered it uh, to accept different cargo. Tanks required a different type of decking. Airplanes were shipped on Liberty ships, but they were in a box. <laughs> Could I have one peep? Amazon. <laughs> what were the specs on these things? 14,000 plus tons. A slug of a boat going along, but here's the thing, look at that, a range of 20,000 miles. Uh, the length, uh, about an eighth of a mile, say from here down to the Mercer Apothecary. All right? The cost, right there, just over $2 million. Now I thought, well, what do I know about shipping? Not much, I'm from the mountains. Um, but it seems that ships were usually not welded, but these were. It made it faster to make. No rivets, all right? So I decided to go to what I didn't really know about, but a destroyer. The basic little fighting arm of a Navy. So what's the difference? Well, it's not quite as big. Look at that. Comparing, it's much faster than a Liberty ship. It's got a shorter range. It's shorter. In other words, it's faster and shorter. But look at the cost of a destroyer. Why? That's a rhetorical question. Armaments. All right thicker plate, but armaments. And uh, it, a destroyer, would take longer because it's riveted together. And somehow I forgot to put on those two things on. I thought of that this morning over breakfast, didn't fix it. But that's the difference, all right? Here is Liberty Ship number one, produced in Baltimore, rolling out in early 19, uh, well, mid-1943, the SS Patrick Henry. It was 
launched by Franklin Roosevelt, who in his speech talked about Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. And from that day on, they were known as Liberty Ships. This was gonna help liberate Europe. That, that's where the term Liberty Ship came from, the Patrick Henry quote. Uh, they got really good at it. This is a Liberty Ship at day two. Built it up by day 14. Had a, approaching a deck on day 19. And day 24 looked like that. All right. And like the infamous and famous Rosie the Riveter, though, these ships had Wanda the Welders. <laughs> okay? And this photo is one I found in the archives. You know, there were African Americans employed to build them. The ships were named for a variety of local groups who, if they sold enough war bonds, had the privilege of naming a ship. All right? Uh, as far as the Af there were African American names, uh, the, the historical names, but ironically to me, there was only one African American woman, the SS Harriet Tubman. All right? So you find that this is rabbit holes, folks. You see what I'm saying? It just goes. Everyone had this designation. EC stood for what it said, emergency cargo, ship number two, but S, steam, get in a moment, and this is a basic design, but remember I said there were other designs. By 1945, these 18 shipyards, now try to get your head around this, were producing three ships every two days. Hear that? Three of these every two days. They built 2,700 of them, all right? And the thing is, they were just ships being used to get stuff to Europe and to the Pacific. But we're going to see another thing that the rabbit holes uh, got me into in a moment. The SS Mary Ball was constructed in Panama City, Florida. Kathy went, went to a wedding once right here, remember? <laughs> And that is the end of the earth. <laughs> we were at this wedding, and I was assigned to go out and get something for breakfast. And I get to one of these old 1920s filling stations. It said, bait. And that's all they sold. But out front, in the middle of nowhere, I found a news box with the New York Times in it. <laughs> Panama City was one of those 18. It was the Wainwright Shipyard. It was a subsidiary of an American, um, Atlanta company, J.A. Jones. I say that because Jones was really building military camps. Now, not here, but like A.P. Hill. They, but they were a construction company, but they had a shipbuilding arm, uh, the Wainwright Company. They published an employee newspaper and I have a copy of that up here for you to see afterward if you'd like. It's called the Wainwright Liberator. That one was published on October 23rd, one week after the christening of the SS Mary Ball. Now, that was christened by Mrs. Claude Pepper, the wife of the Florida Senator, Claude Pepper. Um, rabbit hole number what 12 <laughs> Claude Pepper is infamous to me in that he was defeated after several terms in the early 1950s by opponent who used the smear technique that say said about Pepper that he had matriculated at college was a thespian and practiced nepotism it worked <laughs> Pepper was defeated. It, it's a classic political rabbit hole. Mrs. Pepper, right here. 
had a, and a friend with her, but did the actual christening. She apparently waxed eloquent in a speech, not christening it, but she did something that hadn't been done before. She spoke to the workers in the shipyard. You know, y'all are doing a great job. And every speech then ended by war bombs. I mean, that, that's what they were doing. Hold your job in this war industry, she said, and I, I, I want to make sure that you're in good working conditions and I want to guarantee you get your full 30 minute lunch. But buy war bonds till it hurts. That was a quote, buy war bonds till it hurts. Uh, the Liberator had loads of little quotes in it. My favorite, you know, like, in, hey Kathy, listen to this. You're not gonna believe it. So there was this shoe store in Panama City. Uh, but the Liberator said, Mr. Hart, the owner of the shoe store, his face turned red when he said to a customer, those are women's shoes you're trying on. What do you think I am, replied the welder. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's great stuff. Uh, well, the Mary Ball went into commission October 17, 1943. That's why, 80 years ago. And that's why when I, wasn't, I was gonna speak in December, I thought this was more appropriate. 80, 80 years ago this month, she was assigned not to take stuff to Europe after my lecture about the Atlantic. She was not assigned to take stuff to the islands that the Marines were hopping along in South Pacific. She was sent to Australia, and there she is, the Mary Ball, to be part of getting stuff into the India-Burma area, a lesser known World War II theater of operations. Everybody knows Europe, Eisenhower's there. You know about the Pacific. You generally know about the Mediterranean. But the India Burma Theater, um, there it is. You know, and supplies would come in here, and they were just, they were fighting the Japanese in uh, southern China. All right? And that's what she was helping with. She went through the Panama Canal, sailed across the Pacific to Perth, Australia. Perth is on the western, southwestern coast of, of uh, Australia. So the Pacific is a big place, but this is meant to show you the Indian Ocean. Perth is here. Here's the area of operations. But by the way, up here is important. Then and now, it had oil. All right, and so these things weren't tankers, but some of them were outfitted with big tanks to carry petroleum. So there's, there's a lot of traffic up there to the Arabian Peninsula area. The uh, SS Mary Ball carried many things, but in the incident we're about to talk about, she was carrying tanks, all right? So what do we know about her? Not much. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Well, I'm already past it. There's not a lot about her. But then there came an incident that I found rather interesting. I hope you will. There's another ship called the SS Fort Lee. Now, by the way, there it is in a black and white photograph, but that's not Fort Lee, Virginia, which is now something else, but that's Fort Lee, New Jersey, which if you look at the map, and we just went over it, it's, it's, it's at the New Jersey side of the George Washington, modern George Washington Bridge. In November of 1776, or seven, the Continental Army in Washington had been pushed out of Brooklyn, pushed up Manhattan, and there were two forts built to protect the upper Hudson River, to prevent British ships from getting up the Hudson River. Fort Lee, to build Fort Lee, named for General Charles Lee, one of Washington's generals, 
Washington assigned Hugh Mercer. And that's the connection to Fredericksburg. He didn't know the SS Fort Lee, but my point is that I thought, oh gee, that's two, two Fredericksburg people. So Fort Lee, the ship was named for that site. But what is it? We're back to the Indian Ocean and this book, Lifeboat Number Six. All right. In um, on November second, nineteen forty-four, the Fort Lee was torpedoed in the middle of the Atlantic o uh, Indian Ocean. Its crew began escape at torpedo meaning submarine, right? The crew begins escaping, and they can account for what happened in five of the lifeboats. One completely disappeared and, and, and was sunk, and the other lifeboat got those survivors, so you got two, three, four, and five that are adrift in the Indian Ocean, and they couldn't stay together. The incident involving the Mary, SS Mary Ball is this. So down here is Perth, Australia, See it on the western coast. Up there is the theater of operations where they're taking stuff into. And then over here, big O for oil. So those are the central points on this. And, and there's an interesting other thing that I didn't know about. It seems the Japanese allowed the Germans to build a submarine repair and refitting base in, in the East Indies. So there was a German submarine base there. And I when I first heard about this and got reading, I assumed it was a Japanese sub that had torpedoed the Fort Lee. It was a German sub out of this site. Uh, so the Fort Lee was sailing out of Perth, headed up here. Uh, the Mary Ball, was up there, but the sub came westward. The Mary Ball is coming southward, having been up to the Burmese coast, and at approximately, in the, literally the middle of the Indian Ocean, the Lee is torpedoed and begins to sink. So it's sinking, the sub surfaces, the captain says, do you have everything you'll need? Yeah, yeah, but you're talking, well, that's it, and it goes away. So there's this little strange politeness in the midst of war. Uh, but the lifeboats begin to drift. Three of them are picked up by other ships, but the Mary Ball picks up one, but sees it from afar floating and fires on it, thinking it's an enemy vessel. All right, that was quickly rectified. They picked up the survivors and take them back up to Ceylon. That was quicker than taking them to Australia, Sri Lanka today. All survivors that they could account for were returned home to the States by February of 1945. I found that out. But that was it. They didn't have lifeboat number six. What happened to lifeboat number six? And the guy, Kevin, who wrote this book, began looking for it. And in 2002, he discovers what happened to lifeboat number six, and it, it's uh, regrettable and part of war, but the Japanese picked it up. And there were apparently three survivors in that boat, and uh, they were subjected, unfortunately, to horrific treatment and died and not sure where they're buried, but he was seeking to find out what happened because they knew there were people in it as it drifted away. So that's what that book's about, and it talks about the Mary Ball. Well, that's all we could find about the Mary Ball, including my collaborator, Becky. Now, it, there, there's stuff in the book about that they rescued and find. Well, what happened? 
By 1946, the 2,000 and some Liberty ships were sold off or mothballed. One of the biggest buyers was from Greece, Aristotle Onassis, who turned them into what we would call a tramp steamer you know, or cargo ship. Uh, so I found that interesting. The SS Mary Ball is mothballed yeah, moth at Mobile, Alabama. And they just had the group of ships there waiting to be either used or as happened with the Mary Ball, 28 years later, she was sold for scrap and broken up. I mean, there is no more SS Mary Ball. The Wainwright Company, a subsidiary of J.A. Jones, was totally bought out by Jones, and they're still around, and they build stuff like this now, the Twin Towers in Malaysia. But the rabbit hole that got me going were the mothball ships. And I grew up hearing about the bunch of ships that were called the James River Reserve Fleet down near Smithfield, opposite Newport News. And this is a global picture, and this is some of them. It is called the James River Reserve Fleet. So they're just floating in the James River. But it turns out that's been a mothball site for several wars. And by the World War I, the ships that were in the James River Fleet were wooden ships. So they had to move those somewhere else. And if you look at that, the Potomac River, here we are, up opposite of Quiet Harbor, there's this little bay. See it on the opposite, the Maryland side of the Potomac called Mallows Bay. And if you start looking at Mallows Bay there, what you see are wooden ships that have rotted to the waterline, all right? We were privileged to take a ship over there about two summers ago, and they're just there. And, and, and it's, on the shore, it's a state park, and you could boat there, but there are restrictions. Like, they don't want you on them or crawling around on them. But what is, to me, I tried to get this picture. You can sort of see, see some of the outlines on, on the global thing. So what I was able to do was get an infrared photo. There are that many ships on the far side of the Potomac, about 15 miles from here. Wooden, and that's not the Mary Ball, but this is a rabbit hole, you get that? And a rabbit hole produced something I didn't know, which I'm told regularly by Trav back there that I don't know anything, so <laughs> we'll go with that. This is a picture of one of the four surviving Liberty ships, the John Brown, is anchored at Baltimore Harbor. There's one on the west coast, and two more, ha they're not floating, they've been cut up and used as exhibits in museums, but the bulk of that, those other two ships exist. Everything else, scrapped. And there's our girl, one last time, I have the photo of her up here, the book, and a copy of The Liberator. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.